that God may want to use what he's doing in my life, um, in my story, in my journey, to maybe encourage somebody or empower somebody this morning. So I'm really excited to see what God does, what he has to say. If there are any testimonies, please share them with me. I love hearing that. And if they're not, that's okay. I'm not mad. No judgment, just pray for me. Maybe there will be next time. Amen. Amen. So God has been doing, he's been doing a lot. He's been doing a lot in me personally, and he's been dealing a lot with me about expectation. I feel like I've been actually in a course, um, like a college course, and I've been enrolled in this course since fall of last year, and I'm still in it. And I was reminded that I'm still in this course about expectation literally just two weeks ago in a social psychology lecture. Any social psych people in here? Amen, hallelujah, one, two. <laughs> um, we were talking about expectation generally, the power of expectation, but specifically we were talking about this idea called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now who's heard of this term before? Yeah. Anybody? Okay. So I do have a textbook definition for you so that we're all on the same page. They have it up there? Yes, they do. So self-fulfilling prophecy. When our expectations lead us to believe in ways that elicit the very behavior we expect from others. I'm going to read that again. When our expectations lead us to behave in ways that elicit the very behavior we expect from others. It's the idea that the prophecy that we speak and believe about ourselves and others will essentially come to pass. They'll be fulfilled. To put it simply, we often see what we expect to see, and we often get what we expect to get. Self-fulfilling prophecy. And we do this, and this happens not by not by magic or not by mystery. This is not some mysterious, weird process. What happens is that our expectations set in motion a certain set of actions, a certain set of behaviors that bring about a certain end, a certain outcome. Let me say that again. Our expectations bring about a certain set of actions that bring about a certain end. I shared with my class that day one classic example of self-fulfilling prophecy that I actually want to share with you guys so you know I'm not making this up. So I have a quick video that I want you guys to check out and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Let's go ahead and play that video.
Okay, so just to recap, so I'll make sure that you guys understand what I'm trying to say here. Um, this, the self-fulfilling prophecy, AKA Pygmalion effect, AKA Rosenthal, named after one of the researchers, was based on initially the study that was done where experimenters told teachers that there was going to be a handful of students that were going to intellectually blossom over the next year. And that this, this idea of them blossoming was gonna be based on an aptitude test. Now, it was a little bit of a lie because while aptitude tests were done, these handful of students didn't score categorically different from any other students. Their, their scores completely varied. But what they found at the end of the year, at another round of, at the final round of testing, was that those students who the experimenters told that the teachers would blossom were the ones that scored highest on these final aptitude tests. Not because they were any different. Okay, are you guys following? You guys tracking with me? There was nothing different about these students. The only thing different was that the teachers expected that they would succeed. And that expectation, researchers suspected, caused these, te these teachers to spend a little bit more time with them, to give them some challenging material, to provide more encouragement, more praise, and do some things that were probably really behind the reason the students succeeding. So I shared this study with my students, and I personally came across other studies myself showing the power of expectation. But it was actually a specific passage in scripture that God led me to that was really what drove this home for me. And I want you guys to read with me a story in John. And this is a story I'm sure is not new to anybody, and I'm not even going to be preaching it anew. I don't even think I could do that without some further analysis. But there was one specific verse that God highlighted for me that I thought was really, really unique and something that I hadn't thought of before. So I'd like you to read with me John 6, 1 through 12. Excuse me while I try to get this thing right. So, you got it? Perfect. All right, so John 6, 1 through 12. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There, were plenty of grass, there was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now I did go ahead and read the entirety of this passage so that you would be reminded that God provides, he fulfills our needs, he makes a way out of no way, and, and all that good stuff. But I want to draw your attention to verses 5 and 6. This is where God did something a little bit, a little bit cool with me. So again, 5 and 6, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Verse 6 says, he asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? You know what I hear when I see that question? I hear Jesus asking Philip, what do you think I'm going to do here? What do you think I'm going to do here? Who do you think I am? Who do you think 
I will be to you in this moment. What do you think about my ability? What do you think about my power? What do you think about my compassion? What do you think about my ability to meet the people's needs? What do you think I'm going to do here? You see, this isn't Jesus asking Philip for advice or for direction, because the word says that he already knew what he had in mind to do. I believe that this was Jesus asking Philip about his expectation. You guys with me? The power of expectation. And I hear God asking this same question to us today. I don't know what each and every one of you, I couldn't possibly know what you guys are going through. You guys don't know what I'm going through, what particular struggles I have in my life right now. But when I came across that scripture and when I prayed in preparation for this morning, I heard God asking that same question to you guys. In that situation that is still unresolved in your life, what do you think is going to happen there? Wow. In that difficult, trying circumstance, what do you think is going to happen there? In that situation that may be overwhelming you with anxiety at this moment, how do you think that's going to end? In that depression that some of you may be experiencing, in that anxiety, in that loneliness, in that betrayal, in that pain, what do you think is going to happen here? How do you think this is going to end? How do you see God showing up for you? Do you see him showing up at all? As God began to penetrate my heart with these questions and my own personal devotion, and I imagine he's beginning to penetrate me, he's beginning to penetrate some of yours, he began to teach me more about expectation and particularly about this link between what we accept and what we expect. To put it simply, there is a relationship. Those of you who, who have taken research with me, you know what I mean right here. There is a relationship between what we expect and what we accept. What we expect, everybody say what we expect and what we accept. I visited a friend from out of town recently and God helped me make this connection a little bit more clear. We were catching up and she was telling me that she recently had to end a friendship, someone that she loved very sincerely and a friendship that was very, very hard to end because this is someone who seemed to be there for her. It was there for her initially. She, this, my friend felt like she had been baited by this other woman who initially showed herself to be supportive and affirming and validating, but then quickly turned out to be controlling and demanding and manipulative. My friend became sort of a pawn in this girl's hands and a victim of her emotional attacks granted rooted in some of her own deep psychological struggles and issues. And my friend was almost in tears as she was sharing this with me and saying, I'm so embarrassed because I don't know why it took me so long to get out of this friendship, so long to get out of this situation. I don't know why it always takes me so long to get out of relationships that I know are just not good for me. Then she said she had a moment with God where God revealed to her a possible connection between why that was difficult for her and what had gone on in her past. You see, in her, in her past, it included a mother who was proud of her but couldn't give her the love and affection that she deserved. It was crushing to hear my friend say that growing up, all she wanted was a hug. All she wanted was a kiss from her mom. 
All she wanted was to be touched. All she wanted was just intimacy. All she wanted was some affirmation and some assurance that my friend, her daughter, was worthy of love and acceptance. But it was so hard to get that from her mom. Despite it being hard, she kept trying and remembers exhausting herself in her child, childhood, trying to extract love and assurance from her mom. And as she was talking with me, she was making deeper connections about how a childhood of trying to extract love and affirmation from her mom led to an adulthood of trying to extract love and affirmation from people, even when they were so hard to give it. In fact, people that made it harder for her to get that love and acceptance and that assurance, she worked even harder. It was like she was trying to fix something she couldn't fix back in her own childhood. You see, my friend was realizing that she was accepting in relationships the bare minimum because her expectation was that she would receive the bare minimum. You guys tracking with me? There is a link between what we accept and what we expect. If our expectations are lacking of our world, if our expectations are lacking of our God, if our expectations are lacking of ourselves, what would that look like in what we accept? What type of love are we accepting because of lacking expectations of what, of what God can do? What type of friendships are we accepting because of lacking expectations of what God can bring to our lives? What type of, of future are we accepting because of lacking expectations of what God can do through us? What type of prospects are we accepting? What type of conditions are we accepting? What type of health issues, whether physical or mental, are we accepting because we don't have any other expectation that it could be any different? Wow. I'm always gonna struggle in this area. I have no other expectation. I'm always going to have this type of relationship because that I have no other expectation. There's a link between what we accept and what we expect. I for sure saw myself in my friend's story. But, Here's the thing. We don't have to. We don't have to continue accepting a reality that doesn't have to be ours. Right. Here's, here's your, uh, your black history tidbit for the day, because <laughs> I'm black and it's black history month, so. <laughs> um, Ryan Coogler. Writer and director of the record-breaking Black Panther that just came out this past weekend. Anybody seen it? Amen. Now, once upon a time, Ryan Coogler was just a, his words, a short football player, okay, growing up in Oakland, California. He, oh, do I got some Oakland people? <laughs> Praise the Lord, I'm from Ontario, California. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I keep baby right on that. So he was growing up in Oakland, California. He got a football scholarship to St. Mary's College. And um, yeah, he was, you know, doing his football thing. And he happened to take a creative writing course in which he had one assignment where he was to write about a personal experience. And he decided to write about his father almost bleeding to death in his arms. And he wrote this so excellently and so descriptively that his teacher called him in one day and asked him, Ryan, what do you want to do with your life? And he said, I want to play football and become a doctor and influence my community. Commendable goals. And she said to him, I think you should be a screenwriter. No, that wasn't a thought that he ever had before, but this teacher kind of planted a seed of screenwriting in his mind. 
Cut the long story short, the football program at St. Mary's ended and he transferred to another program and continued his football career, but started to fill his curriculum with more film classes. And he reportedly said that he, at that time, fell in love with filmmaking, graduated, drove to LA, got into USC film school, and pursued his film career. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Ryan Coogler, well, it sounds like some of you are familiar with the movie, but Ryan didn't accept a reality that didn't have to be his. And this is what I mean. He didn't accept a reality based even in statistics. He didn't base his, his he didn't accept a reality based on the statistics of black men in America. He didn't base a reality, he, he didn't accept a reality and statistics based off of athletes after their athletic careers end. He didn't accept a reality based on statistics about being just a young man in Oakland. And he didn't accept a reality based on statistics rooted in, in what goes on in the film industry, because check it out, I don't know if you guys know, I said this is your black history tidbit, that the top 100 grossing films over the last 10 years, for e each year over the last 10 years, has been led by black directors less than 6% of the time. This was not a hopeful picture for Ryan Coogler, but he didn't accept that. He didn't accept that impossibility. And he went on to create the award-winning Fruitvale Station at age 27, the award-winning Creed at age 29, and now the award-winning record-breaking record -breaking first all-black cast superhero movie, Black Panther, at the age of 31. Yeah. He didn't accept a reality that he didn't have to accept. Yeah. I'm gonna say that again. He didn't accept a reality that he didn't have to accept. And I hear God challenging us in that same way this morning. If you don't have to accept a reality, don't accept it. Be the person that says, yeah, I know what people who look like me end up becoming, but I don't have to be that person. Yeah, I know what people who grow up in my neighborhood grow up to become, but that doesn't have to be my reality. Yeah, I know the statistics of people my age. Yeah, I know the statistics of people my race. Yeah, I know the statistics of people my gender, but that does not have to be me. Yeah. And it won't be. You can reject a reality that doesn't have to be yours. You don't have to accept it. You can increase your expectations of your world, of your God, and of yourselves. You guys track it with me? Yeah. Hmm. Even as I stand here, I'm, I'm thinking of situations that I'm, I'm still accepting mm. that I don't have to. I've said this before, but I, I really, this is just the only question God keeps wanting me to ask you guys is what do you think is going to happen? Wow. What do you think is going to happen with your futures? What do you think is gonna happen with that problem you're going through right now? What do you expect? If I were to summarize what I know God wants to do for your life, I would summarize it in one word, and that's more. Everyone say more. more. Everyone say more. more. God wants to do more in your life, y'all. He wants to do more for you. He wants to do more to you. And he wants to do more through you. Now, I'm going to actually have you say that with me. Say, God wants to do... God wants to do more for you. Say for you. For you. Actually say for me. for me. God wants to do more to me. To me. God wants to do more. Me. God wants to do more. What's the first one? For me. God wants to do more. To me. 
God wants to do more. One more time. God wants to do more. God wants to do more. God wants to do more. And you need to expect that. Because that expectation is going to do something to your life. That's going to open you up and prepare you to, for what God wants to do in all of those areas. You can expect that for you, God wants to show himself God to you. Have you ever prayed, God, be God in this situation? That is one of the most powerful prayers that I've ever prayed. Because when I've gotten on my knees and say, God, I don't know where to turn, but I need you to be God. And I expect that your realness and your existence and your power is going to come through for me. The type of things I see when I pray that, it's insane. God wants to do more for you. It's easy to get jaded because when we sometimes have these plans and we wish it and we don't always see them go, that we want them to go, we think that they're not working out. We think that they'll never work out. And we, our jadedness sort of blindsides us to everything else that God might be doing in our life at that moment. But don't do that. Don't go down that route. Don't go down that path of thinking that God is not working just because you don't see it right in front of your very eyes. And God isn't doing anything in, er in any area of your life. That's what the enemy wants to get you to do, to forget everything that God is doing, to forget who God is and who God could be and will be to you. But God wants to do more for you. He's a God that wants to give you life and give it, you, give it to you abundantly. Amen? Amen? And you can expect that God wants to do more to you. Now, this one's fun. I, I, I remember uh, riding home with my sister uh, two weeks ago, and we were talking about who's more petty. <laughs> <laughs> because this, this is the type of things that we talk about. And so she was telling me, you know, she was providing her own commentary, if you will, on something that just happened before we left an event. And I said, sister, that's petty. And she said, that's not petty. I'm not petty. And I'm like, if I would have said that, you would have called me petty. And she said, well, I'm not petty. I'm honest. Uh and I was like, oh, is that what we're calling it? <laughs> so all these said, the next time any of y'all want to call me on and say, I'm out here being petty, I'm going to say, y'all, I'm just being honest. <laughs> but I've actually seen God work on my pettiness, praise the Lord. In 2018, I felt like I came into this year just holy and pure and fresh and void of all pettiness. And then like day three came around and I did something and I'm like, wow, I'm still petty. So God, God, I've seen though the way God bring different people in different situations in my life because I'm not gonna lie, he's trying to grow me up out of that. He's trying to grow me into a person who knows how to better handle her frustrations or feeling like I'm being attacked or feeling like I'm being misunderstood. And he's doing that intentionally because he knows where he wants to take me. And he knows that there's going to be all kinds of people and all types of situations that I'm going to have to deal with. And if I'm going to sustain that position, I'm going to have to be a little less petty. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Put your hands together if you struggle with pettiness. <laughs> God is working on you too. And you can expect that he will bring situations and people and opportunities for you to grow out that pettiness. Here's the kicker, if you want to. And some of y'all don't want to change. That's another problem. That's another problem. But you can expect that God wants to add growth and character to your life because of where he wants to take you. You can also expect more in the area of what God wants to do through you. Y'all, I don't even have to go into, go, go into it. I'm definitely not going to get political, but we all know that our country needs some help right now. That we need leaders in different spheres that are going to bring people together and inspire people to want to do better and feel better and become better. Yeah. Well, God is waiting on y'all, yes. including that little pettiness, because he's going to work on that too. But he's waiting on y'all. And he wants to do more through you. He wants to shake up kingdoms and nations and cultures through you. Yeah, 
And you can expect that he's going to bring those opportunities as he's working on your character, as he's showing himself to be God to you and do something crazy powerful in your life if you let him. What do you think God wants to do with you? What do you think God wants to do for you? What do you think God wants to do through you? Your expectation is gonna be the thing that makes it happen. One last story, and I hate to end on a little bit of a sad note, but I just thought this was such interesting timing that this would happen while I'm preparing for this. But over the weekend, my friend shared some really tough news with me. You see, her uncle, um, Friday night, this past Friday night, ended up taking his own life. He shot himself in the head. And she, told me that this was a man that was a very well-loved man. I, mean, I knew him myself. He was always at every family function. But he was a man full of pride. He was a man that obviously struggled with depression. But he was a man full of pride. And as she was sharing this story with me, I couldn't help to think that there was a moment in his life in the middle of that depression, that he had a chance to answer this same question. What do you think's gonna happen here? Who do you think's gonna win? And the way he answered that question shows to me what ended up happening to his life. I have a feeling that when, he, when God posed that to him, when his spirit asked him, what do you think is going to happen? How do you think this is gonna end? Who do you think is gonna win? He answered it in a way that gave him no more hope. And my prayer for you guys is that in this moment, in this year, in this week, with whatever you're struggling with, whatever battle, whatever war that you're waging, that you'll begin to answer that question in a way where you'll be saved, in a way where you'll find hope, in a way that's the reality that God wants for you, which is the reality of life. What do you think is going to happen here? Who do you think is going to win? As you reflect on those, I'm gonna have the worship, be, worship band come up here, give us a little bit more time to reflect on uh, what Jesus is doing in our hearts. Amen.